to talk to you about the life-changing power of praise. And this morning we come to, uh, as we come to Acts 16, Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey. They're now in Europe. They're in Macedonia. They're at a city that is known as Philippi, a Roman colony named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. And while they were ministering, there was a slave girl that was uh, maybe had been one of the oracles of Delphi, certainly was possessed by that spirit that uh, occupied uh, women who served in that capacity, and because of that was able to forecast the future. And we talked about all the realities of that. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit, literally what that is, is a pneuma pythona, a python spirit, a very powerful spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. This statement is going to have a huge bearing on what happens later in the chapter. You say, if it's a demon, why is a demon telling the truth? They may, they're inveterate liars, but they may tell the truth long enough to be able to work their deception. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. So a very powerful spirit is gone through one command from the Apostle Paul, which says a great deal about his own power and ability to do that uh, through the power of the Lord. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making huge money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. Uh, they are using this as their concern. It has more to do with anti-Semitism to work the crowd up than it does with the fact that they're seeking property damages. By they're, they're advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. So here the slave owners are. They're very, very wealthy as be, because of the slave girl. And in a town as small as Philippi, it's not a big city, uh, they would know the magistrates, the judges, the officials. And so they go to them, and they're not seeking property damages, which they could have sought. Lost income, lost revenue. Instead, they're seeking a civil punishment on the basis of Paul and Silas' nationality, that they are Jews. Why would that gain any traction in Philippi? Because prior to this, history tells us, Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome. And he did it because of what he called a man named Crestus, uh, Christ. So now there is a wave of anti-Semitism that is coming out of Rome, and Philippi being a Roman colony, not being hospitable to the Jews in the first place because there's no synagogue there. So this is an anti-Semitic city. They seize Paul and Silas because they are Jewish. Timothy has a Greek name. Luke is not Jewish, and so they are not seized. Let's look at it in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. This is a massive miscarriage of justice because Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. It's illegal to beat them without a trial. As Roman citizens, even before they would be beaten, they would have the right to appeal to Caesar and present their case to them. And to beat them without a trial, the magistrate, because they're Roman citizens, the magistrate if it was discovered he had had Roman citizens beaten, he could be executed in response. As well, let me just say this, saying you're a Roman citizen, hey, we're a Roman citizen, 
is generally not enough to convince the authorities because anybody could say that, but only about 10%, five to 10% of the population in the empire had citizenship, so it was rare, and you had a, a document that proved you were a citizen. So here when we read this, it says the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beat. They may have said, we're Roman citizens, and the magistrate, because there is a, an anti-Semitic bias, orders them stripped and beaten. What are we talking about? Uh, here would be a picture of a magistrate, and wherever the magistrate went in a city, they had with them six individuals who were called lictors. And a lictor carried these rods, wooden rods, wrapped in leather, and there would be six, and it was a message to the people to tell the people, listen, don't mess with me, because if, if you break the law and you come before me, you may be on the receiving end of the rods. Because what would be done is the person would be stripped Often, their clothes torn to pieces. It's to be very humiliating. So they're naked. The leather on the sticks would be used to bind their hands and their feet. They would be hung typically by their feet. And then these rods would be used to beat them. Usually, there was more than one lictor beating the person. And we can assume that in Paul and Silas' case, there were three people beating each of them. Historians tell us that when you were beaten with rods, and Paul says, I was beaten with rods three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When you were beaten with rods, historians tell us typically it broke most of your ribs, often fractured bones in the arm and bones in the legs. At times, they purposefully tried to break the feet, the bones in the feet of the person. So this is a horrific beating. I, I'm going to suggest to you it is probably the worst beating Paul will ever receive in his life. After they're beaten, notice what it says next. After they've been severely flogged. So they're beaten with rods. And the word we know they were beaten with rods because the word there, rabidzo, is the word that is used for rods. So they're beaten with rods. Then they are flogged. And the flogging would be, a person would be hung up by their hands, and uh, the Romans had a, a flagrum. This is a picture of it. Um, and they could have, uh, some people call it a cat of nine tails, but um, it might have 12 straps, it might have nine straps, six straps, or three straps. Most of them, they say, look like this, but you can see the pieces of metal. You can see uh, designed to cut and tear the flesh and then embedded with other sharp objects. And so usually you would be beaten, give me the next picture, you'd be suspended from a post and you'd be beaten by two different uh, soldiers or legionnaires, each with a flagrum uh, designed to peel the skin from your body from the, the top of the knees, the bottom of the thighs, up to the hairline. Uh, you would have virtually no skin left. 40 lashes was a Jewish prohibition that you, you gave them 39 lashes, no more than 40. The Romans had no such uh, prohibition, so they are severely flogged. Here's an animation that gives you an idea. Uh, one lash, two lash, three, four, five, six. I mean, so it is a violent punishment. You say, why are you doing this graphic explanation? Because most people, when they read Acts 16, if you were raised in church, you had the little flannel graph where you see Paul and Silas in this little Puritan style stock, and they're clothed, and they're happy with their hands raised, praising the Lord. That's not this. They are, their skin has been filleted their bones have been broken. And now watch what happens. 
Um, and all of that helps us understand the significance and the enormity of how they respond to this. It's really unimaginable. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell. So now they're, they're in the worst cell in the prison. The inner cell, there'd be no ventilation. There would be no light. Uh, there would certainly be the stench of, of, of human feces and of all that had happened uh, in that cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Here's a picture of stocks, but it's really, this is more of the Puritan kind of stocks where hands go here, feet go here. Uh, the Roman stocks were different. They had several holes along the way, and they were, you were never put just feet straight. Your feet were always spread apart to inflict maximum discomfort because your legs would begin to cramp up, and now they are, their feet are in stocks, their back, their buttocks, their legs, are completely raw, no flesh on them, their bones are broken. It's a terrible situation. Um, verse 25, and about midnight, it pretty much says it all. It's midnight. Midnight's when it's dark and you can't see. Midnight's when Things are always worse. The older you get, the more you know that's true. Midnight's when you're trying to do the right thing and everything gets worse. Midnight's when a person you committed to love for the rest of your life walks out. Midnight's when you're doing your best to serve God, but it seems instead the devil's winning. Midnight's when you've worked hard, you deserve the promotion, but somebody politicked and they got it instead. I say that only because there are some of you, and you're at the midnight hour. It's dark, it's unfair, you can't move, you don't know where to turn, and if your body isn't hurting, your heart is, and it's midnight. Let me just say this, for the Christian, how we respond at midnight is the ultimate proof of what we think about God. Because honestly, anybody can praise when it's daylight and everything's going their way. But here's Paul in verse 25. It says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how they can even talk. You wonder what it was like in that cell. You wonder who said it first. I assume Paul did. Maybe not, but Paul says, si Silas. Yeah. I, I think we ought to sing. <laughs> Silas, Silas is like, I can't even talk. How can I sing? Paul's saying, was saying anyway. This is an amazing thing that they can even with broken ribs. Have you ever had a broken rib? If you have one, get, get several and now you can't move anywhere without hurting. Here's the thing I would suggest to you. They're not only singing in prison, but I'm, I believe they're singing because they're in prison. This is a whole nother level of following Christ. The reason why I say it is in Acts 5, when the apostles were flogged. They ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer. So here's Paul, and he's saying, we're suffering just like Jesus did. We're, we're suffering for his glory and for his sake. And in the midst of that, Paul makes a decision, he and Silas, to do something that will change everything in their life. And it's a decision that you and I can make that will change absolutely everything. It doesn't make sense in the natural. So when I say it, you're, some of you are going to think, well, that doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of good. That'll do. But the thing is, the things that the natural mind doesn't understand, that the spiritual man understands, the spiritual things 
are the greater realities, and they will change a person's life. When you decide to praise, when we praise God in the midst of trials and circumstances, some very powerful things happen. I want to give you three things that happen. Number one, praise changes you. Praise changes you. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They weren't complaining. They were praising. And it changed them. In fact, what they could barely do, they started to do. And I believe they got stronger as they did it. In fact, maybe the best way to explain to you what praise can do is to simply allude to just a few verses from Psalm 34. The whole chapter is filled with the power of praise, but it's written, if you go to Psalm 34, at the top there's this, usually this little italic writing that gives you a superscription. It, it tells you why the psalm was written, who wrote it, what the circumstances were, and you find in the superscription that it was written by King David Regarding the time he pretended to be insane in front of Abimelech. You say, what does that mean? Well, David was running from Saul. Saul was going to kill him. Saul was the king. David was the anointed next king. Saul was jealous. Saul was going to kill him. So David gets, you know, when you're, when you're afraid and you're not trusting God, you're going to make dumb decisions. David makes a terrible decision. He decides, well, you know what? Saul doesn't like me, and you know the enemies of my enemy are my friends. I'm going to go to Abimelech. He's a Philistine, and I will live there, and then I won't have to worry about Saul chasing me. But the problem is, David had been a general in Saul's army and had killed thousands of Philistines. So now he's in the city, and, and Abimelech's staff says to him, Hey, that's David. That's the one who they sing about in a song that says Saul has killed his thousands and David is ten thousands. He's in the city. In other words, we can kill him. And David right away is like, oh snap, I made a bad decision. And so what David does is David starts letting spit and saliva go on his beard and he starts scribbling on the walls of the city and the gate like he's insane. And the, the king looks at him and says, what, am I, am I short of people who are out of their mind? Get him out of here, I don't need another. So they let him go and David now writes Psalm 34. And here's what David is saying. Dave, David is saying, I've learned a few things about the power of praise. My problem started when my praise stopped. If I hadn't stopped praising God, my problems would have resolved in a totally different way. So David writes this down for you and I about what happens when you and I praise God in the midst of our problems. Number one, praise will give you a heart for the battle. I'll praise the Lord at all times. I will continually speak his praise. When things are going good, when things are going bad, when I feel like it, when I don't feel like it, I am going to make sure that I don't let my feelings determine when I praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord all the time because if I won't listen to my feelings and I'll listen to my faith, I'll find that my praise will bring a solution and a power to my problems. Too many people are governed by their faith or by their feelings. Oh, I don't feel like praise, praising God. And the devil's like, oh, I'm so glad to hear that because your, your problems are only going to get worse. But when you and I start to praise God, powerful things happen. David says this, I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. What happens is, as I start to praise him, it starts to change my heart. You know why? Because God inhabits the praise of his people. As I begin to praise him, his presence comes close. As I begin to praise him, his power starts to work. As I begin to praise him, things start to change. The key to life's problems is to praise the Lord. David says it changed my heart. Number two, praise will free you from your fears. Look, he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. What does that mean? Oh, magnify. When you, got, when you magnify something, what are you doing? You're making it bigger. 
And when God is bigger, David is saying, oh, come on, let's make God big. Because when God's big, my problems get small. When my problems are big, then God looks small. What are you looking at? You're looking at your problem? Are you praising God? Are you making a big deal out of your problems? Are you making a big deal out of God? It will determine how you feel in the midst of that trial. David says, when I magnify him and I exalt him, he frees me from all of my fears. Well, praise will give you joy in the midst of trouble. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. You know, there's just something in your presence. The Bible says is what? Fullness of joy. How do you and I get into his presence? We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. When you begin to praise God, you are coming right into the presence of God. You're coming right before the throne. And when you're in his presence, there's fullness of joy. When you're in his presence, the world could be collapsing around you, but there is a joy in your heart that the world didn't give you and the world can't take away. There's a joy that's a supernatural joy because you know if God is for me, who can be against me? I don't know what What's going to happen? I'm just no longer afraid about what's going to happen. Praise changes absolutely everything. Finally, number four, praise brings God's help to deliver you from your troubles. In desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. Praise changes you. Gives you a totally different perspective. I can't prove it, but I have to believe when I read the whole story that if Paul was beaten with rods and his bones were broken, that there was some healing that went on even as he was praising God. I mean, because you watch what he's doing and you're like, how do you do that after being severely beaten? There's a power of the Lord that's at work when you praise God. Number two, praise changes your situation. Praise has the power to set a miracle in motion. Complaining can't do that. Some of you are in a problem and you're complaining. That's not going to change anything. In fact, it could really make it worse. Praise sets a miracle in motion. Anxiety and worry can't do that. Frustration can't do that. Fear can't do that. But when you and I begin to praise God, all of a sudden what happens is we're releasing the presence of God, the power of God into that situation in a way that will dynamically change it. Now watch this, because I think this is notable. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. What that's telling us is their praise was public. Other people heard them. The prisoners heard them. The jailer heard them. I want to ask you this. When's the last time people around you in the midst of your problem heard your praise publicly and they knew, man, it's not looking good for you, but there you are praising the Lord. Part of the reason that their praise affected the people around them is because they refused to keep it private. Sometimes it, what, what happens is when you and I are praising God publicly, powerful things are going to happen to a world that is watching because they're thinking, well, that's crazy. They're thinking, I'd never serve a God who'd get me in that kind of situation. Let me be like that. Why would you call out to him? If he were so good, why are you in that situation in the first place, not realizing that God's using that to change you, to change them, and to demonstrate his power in a way that will never be forgotten? This is really amazing. Look at it. The other prisoners were listening to them. It says, suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Suddenly, out of nowhere, unexpectedly, things changed. Listen, when we praise God, we're introducing that suddenly, You're introducing that unexpectedly. You're introducing that out of nowhere. You're you're introducing that unpredictably component in your situation. 
A lot of Christians have it backwards. They say, you know, well, when God does this, I'm going to really praise him. No, 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 no. That's backwards. You praise him before the miracle. That's what sets the miracle in motion. That's what brings about the deliverance of God. He's designed it that way. It comes down to this. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. And when you're praising God, you're saying, I'm believing you for a miracle, and you're going to see a miracle in your situation. This is all over the Bible. The walls of Jericho, did they come down before the shout of praise or after the shout of praise? They shouted praise, and then the walls came down. We could go over and over in the scripture and see that principle. Here are Paul and Silas. They're praising God, and all of a sudden there is an earthquake, but it's the kind of earthquake that does something different. Rather than the building collapsing, what happens is the prison doors open. Rather than the, the timbers cracking and falling, the chains fall off. That's the power of praise to do what is impossible in the situation you're in. I mean, no wonder Paul will write to the Philippians, the Christians in this same city down the line, not once, not twice, not three times, four times, rejoice in the Lord. And the last time in Philippians 4, 4, he says, and rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Because when you and I praise God, it changes our situation. It has everything to do with releasing the power of God in your life. And there's some of you, and you've not been able to work up a praise. But by the end of this message and before you go home, you need to lift your voice and praise to God. Because as you do that, your situation is going to change. God is going to do things suddenly unexpectedly, out of nowhere, unpredictably, you never imagined would happen. Praise does that. Number three, praise changes other people. Our praise will affect the people around us. The other prisoners were listening. Look at it. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They had to be thinking, what in the world are those guys doing? A lot of good that will do until their chains fell off. You know, the world doesn't understand. Your praise not only affects your situation, it affects the people around you. This is why it's important for people to hear your praise in the midst of a trial. This is why it's important for people to know you're trusting God when it seems it's midnight. You're trusting God when it seems there's no hope. You're trusting God when it seems there's nothing left to do. You're trusting God when it seems the world's turned against you. You begin to praise God. The world's watching. It's going to change their life. Verse 27. The jailer woke up. He saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped and he thought he would be held liable. But Paul shouted, go ahead and do it. <laughs> Fooled you. <laughs> Paul's like, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights. You know what this tells me here? When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's already forgiven the jailer, so he can do the things forgiveness does. Listen, if you're going to wait until somebody asks to be forgiven before you'll forgive, it's going to warp your, your heart, and it's going to make it difficult for you to experience his power in a way that changes others' lives. Paul's already forgiven him. And so when the jailer's ready to take his life after all he's done to Paul, Paul's like, don't do it, don't do it. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's an odd question for a jailer to ask. How could the jailer know to ask that question because there had been a slave girl with a python spirit who'd been running all over town for several days saying, these men 
are servants of the Most High God who are telling you how to be saved. And what Satan intended for evil, God turned the tables and used for good. We read on this. It says, then he brought them and out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Probably had never, ever done that for any prisoner. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. Would you notice? They're going to have a meal together. They're going to entertain Paul. But before they go in the house to sit down, before they have breakfast, because it was the middle of the night, before they get up and have an early breakfast, he's going to be baptized. Listen, in the New Testament, you get saved, you get baptized. You get saved, you get baptized. He does, the jailer doesn't wait till he feels ready. He doesn't wait until he understands it. He doesn't wait for all the reasons people name that they want to wait. The jailer gets baptized immediately because there's something about when you and I immediately follow the Lord. Here's what, here's what you're doing. You're setting up a pattern in your life. If he says it, I do it. If he says it, I do it. If he says it, I do it. If he puts it in my heart, I'm doing it. It's that. And here's how that makes a difference. Then when he tells you to do things that you can't understand, maybe it's tithing. Or if he tells you to do things like a word of knowledge, hey, God's going to do this, then you can do it. Then when he tells you to go pray for somebody, you've already built the habit of he says it, I do it. He says it, I do it. And that's when you begin to see a powerful uh, set of circumstances in your life. Delayed obedience will keep you from knowing the blessing of God on your life in the way he would desire you to know it. If you've not been baptized, you should get baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Here's a jailer that probably was a very miserable person, probably a very mean person, probably the kind of person who didn't care about people at all. You would get run down. If you were in that kind of situation and that was your life and you were, you were abusing people, punishing people, chaining people, all those different things, watching people die, and all of a sudden, this guy has, he, he has a 180. He's a completely different person. That's the power of praise coupled with the Word of God to change a person's life. He leaves totally different. Let me just read these last verses just quickly to you because they're really interesting. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the, with the order, release those men. Why? Let me tell you why. Because there was a servant girl with a spirit who ran around saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. They've come to tell you how to be saved. And now when they whip and beat them, all of a sudden there is an earthquake that causes prison doors to open, chains to fall off. Are you kidding me? They're scared out of their mind. Because if that servant girl was true and they would have believed her to be true, and an earthquake happens, we got to get these guys out of here. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave and go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial. Even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come and escort us out. I love Paul. He's just... You know, now here's the thing. If Paul wants his pound of flesh, he's got him. You see, a lot of times as Christians, we want revenge and we'll take whatever the law allows. I'm going to get even. You cost me pain and suffering. I'm going to carry these injuries. I'm not saying people shouldn't have a right to recover what they need for recovery. But Paul could have had them executed. Paul could have had a lot of things happen to them. But again, Paul's forgiven them. The officers reported this to the magistrates when they heard that. Paul and Silas, 
that were, they were Roman citizens. Now they're really alarmed. It says, they came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. And I love what Paul does. They say, please leave the city. And Paul says, all in good time. He went to Lydia's house. He's like, we're going to go over there. We're going to have church. We're going we're to have fellowship with the brothers. We don't know how long they stayed there. You have to believe that given their wounds, unless God healed them, they were going to need time to recover. So they may have stayed there some time. We don't know. Scripture's unclear. Then they left. Used to be we. Luke was with them. But I think Luke might have found love with Lydia. And I mean, that's what some scholars believe. But what changed it all? How do you get a situation where they're abusing you on an anti-Semitic bias, and now all of a sudden they're appeasing you? What changed it? Praise. What changed them? Paul's praise. What changed the jailer? Paul's praise. What changed Paul's situation? Praise. What changed Paul and Silas? Praise. What will change your situation? Praise. What will change the people around you? Praise. What will change you? Praise. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Praise will release God's power in your life. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.